Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 9 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Giltaka. Thanks for listening in. In this episode, I've got a few CCFR updates as well as some firearm news and a blockbuster telephone interview with Member of Parliament for Prince George, Peace River, North Rockies, Bob Zimmer. Uh, So information you probably uh, have not heard anywhere. I was quite surprised to hear it and and it's regarding why the long gun registry data still exists. So the inside track on that. Um, So we've got a great show lined up for you and we'll get started right after this. It's a fact that licensed gun owners do not represent a disproportionate risk to public safety. Yet, whether it's backdoor gun registries, complex regulations, or unreasonable penalties for paperwork offenses, Canada's anti-gun bureaucrats will never stop trying to eliminate your will or ability to own and use firearms. Take action, take a stand, and join the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights by visiting us at www.firearmrights.ca. A CCFR update. All right, welcome back, everybody. Here's your CCFR update. So the first uh, thing I want to talk about is the CCFR has a raffle happening for a custom AR-15 lower receiver. Now that is in the close Facebook group. So that's um, if you're not in that group, try to get into it. If you're at all into Facebook, there's 18,000 people in there, and it is an incredibly busy page. I was talking to Tracy Wilson actually, and she was telling me that there's anywhere from 50 to 90 posts a day. So if you're looking for Facebook action, that's the place to get it. Uh, but anyway, this uh, this contest is uh, is in there. And it's, uh, as I said, for a, a custom, custom-made AR-15 lower receiver. It's engraved with a CCFR logo and has a serial number because it's a restricted firearm, the lower is, right? And the serial number is CCFR556. So it's a, it's a one of a kind for sure. And uh, that contest is a, I think it closes tomorrow, October 20th. So if you want to get uh, involved in that thing, you better get on it. Um, next item. I did want to remind everyone to check the CCFR business member directory. If you want to know if your favorite firearms business supports the CCFR. So I've talked to firearm business uh, owners before and managers and stuff. And they're like, oh, we, we support the CCFR. And I always go into the member directory and I check to see if they're business members. And a lot of times they're not. And I'm like, well, how much do you support the CCFR if you're not a business member? Um, just so you guys know, what does it take to be a business member? It's $100 a year to be a, um, a business member of the CCFR. And that allows you to advertise in the closed Facebook group. And of course, as I mentioned, there's 18,000 people in there. Um, and you also get listed in the directory so that people can go to the website and check if you are a business member. So um, if you want to check if you're if uh, if your favorite business is a member, you can go to ccfr.ca. I'm trying to push that new web address and or um, firearmrights.ca, the traditional web address. And I think it's on the um, the top menu. You click on membership and then business member directory and you can find out if your favorite business is a, is a business member. And if they aren't, ask them why they aren't. Uh, that's always good for a good discussion. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure that... Uh, that uh, people remember where that is and to uh, and always to check and uh, encourage the people that you do businesses with to support the CCFR. Um, if you're a member, you know all the stuff that we're involved in. So it's a it's definitely a great, uh, great cause. Next item, the CCFR hosted yet another ladies event. Now, this was a goose hunt. And um, I'm just going to read this post from Kelly Kincaid. She writes in the uh, in our Facebook group. I would like to say a great big thank you to to the SFRC. So some people would recognize SFRC by their web address, which is the ammosource.com. I've been going there for a long time personally. Uh, and also a huge thanks to Capital Waterfowling Company for sponsoring us ladies of the CCFR on our goose hunt today. Capital Waterfowling, we ladies have some work to do, a lot of practicing in fact, but Robert Foote was the superstar with those calls. I guess they were calling in geese. Uh, we were successful because we had your support. So you have my greatest thanks. So thanks, Kelly, for posting that. I was talking to Tracy Wilson, actually. And I guess this was the ninth or 10th ladies event that was organized under the CCFR banner in the last two years. And that is a ton of work. So 
Um, I just want to say big thanks to all the people at the CCFR that organize and run these events. I don't do that stuff. I don't even know when these events are happening, to be honest with you, right? So a lot of work and these these types of events produce real results because they change public opinion. You're bringing in people that have never seen a gun or shot a gun or never been hunting. And uh, these people are getting an opportunity to to participate in this kind of stuff. So very, very valuable. And don't ever underestimate the value of these types of events. So anyway, just want to throw that in there. Last but not least, I wanted to mention, actually, you know what? Second to last, because there's something I don't even have written down here to talk about that we definitely need to cover. But last but not least, I want to mention uh, that I will be revealing the details of our new contest in episode 10. So two weeks from now. Now, this contest is being held to fund a specific project that we have coming up in the new year. I can't really talk about it yet because there's still some some legal stuff that we're dealing with, but it's going to be the biggest project we've ever done. So really exciting. Stay tuned for that. And um, and definitely stay tuned in two weeks to find out about, about this latest contest, which is definitely, this is different than any other contest we've done. And it's really, really cool. So uh, very exciting. Now the, uh, the last, truly the last item I want to talk about is uh, coming up here at the end of the month, the end of October, uh, October the 30th, if memory serves me correctly, uh, is the second anniversary. We will have now completed two years of the CCFR. We've done a ton of stuff and come a long way and uh, done a lot of things that have never been done for firearm owners uh, here in Canada. Um, one thing I will say is we can't do any of this stuff without funding, without money, because everything costs money, sorry to say. So if, uh, if you were one of those first uh, couple of thousand people that joined up in the first couple of weeks of the CCFR existing, uh, for one, you guys are the trailblazers. So thank you very much for the support. The, we, we're only here today, two years later, because of you guys. Um, but what I do want to ask you is make sure that you renew your membership um, on time because um, we need to keep the funding rolling because we have a couple of really, again, real trailblazing, interesting things that have never been tried or done before, and they cost a lot of money to do. Um, now, recently, I will add this too. Recently, there uh, people have been asking about audited financials. So I want to give you this information. I know it's not really an update, but it's good information nonetheless. Our audited financials are, uh, are out there and they are available upon request. Now, all not-for-profit organizations under Corporations Canada rules have to have yearly audited financials. Now, if you're a member of a firearm organization or any other not-for-profit organization, make sure you're requesting these financials. It's your, I mean, this is your information. You're, you're, your, your funding, your donations go to fund the mission of these organizations and make sure you're asking for them. If they're not available, you should be asking why. So we finally, this one was late, but we finally have our second year uh, audited financials in. So uh, that's another update that I did want to kind of throw out there. And once again, if, you, um, if your membership is coming up soon, please, um, please renew it as fast as you can because uh, I'm really excited to tell you what we have in the upcoming year and we have to fund that stuff. All right, so let's uh, let's move on to the next segment, which is the news, uh, and we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back after this. There are politicians and bureaucrats in Canada who believe honest, hard-working Canadians cannot be trusted with firearms. These people will stop at nothing to make sure they are the only ones who can possess them. Let them know you don't consent to their ongoing campaign against you. Stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms now and for generations to come. Donate or become a member of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights by visiting us at www.firearmrights.ca. And now, the news on CCFR Radio. Hey everybody, welcome back. All right, so a little bit of CCFR news. The first item I'd like to cover is that iPolitics story about pending firearm legislation, and it was sort of connected to the shooting in Las Vegas. This story originated from some off-the-cuff comments in the House, and it morphed into something I think a lot bigger than it should have been. Um, the CCFR actually contacted public safety, and we were told that their statements were just basically reiterating the Liberal Party election platform from 2015. They were just saying, yeah, we're going we're gonna to form a bill very soon, this is them sort of taking the heat off themselves when the anti-gun folks, you know, start losing their minds when there's a, a shooting in another country, no less. But they're just saying, yeah, you know what? You're going to see that bill very soon. You know, the stuff that we promised back in 2015. 
So, you know, there's really isn't anything to panic about right now. Um, what we can do is continue to run our deterrent operations, which basically in parentheses is the CCFR, um, you know, just to continually executing on our mandate, which is really simply just to educate non-gun owning Canadians about uh, gun owners and also to represent law abiding licensed gun owners in the most possible way. Um, you know, presenting gun owners uh, to the Canadian public and showing what trustworthy, great people we are, which is actually just accurate. <laughs> so we're just going to continue to do that kind of stuff, do what we do. Um, when there's a specific bill that comes out, we will, you know, we'll uh, come up with specific measures to battle that directly. But without a bill, it's really hard to get a hold of your MP and say, hey, you know, s just stop thinking whatever it is you're thinking. <laughs> it's just not a real, a real specific message. Now, um, what are, you know, are they up to stuff behind the scenes? Yeah, they're always up to things. I mean, we know the RCMP have been, you know, giving, uh, you know, parliament uh, reports and all kinds of dangerous stuff like SKSs and, and CZ 858s and all the rest. That's, all that stuff continues behind the scenes, but without a specific bill behind it or a specific action that the RCMP takes uh, or parliament takes, we really can't uh, organize you know, actual uh, initiatives uh, for that. Now, there are some things going on. There's the matter of Bill C-47 and Bill C-52. And I'm going to go off script here. And well, as I've been doing this whole time, but anyway, <laughs> don't really have a script. But um, we reached out to Bob Zimmer to have a chat with us about Bill C-47. So this is what I'm going to tell you. It's kind of interesting. So I, I got Bob on the phone to have a telephone interview and he explained C-47 to me because I just really didn't understand too much about it. And I thought rather than, you know, blabber on about something I really didn't know much about, I'd ask Bob himself. He's the expert, not me. And so he did do that C-47 interview, which I was going to have in this episode, but I've decided not to do that because he said we need to do an interview about Bill C-52 and the inside scoop on why the registry data still exists because he says, I don't think anybody really knows Certainly not, you know, mainstream people and half the people in parliament don't know why it still exists and what was going on there. And I'm like, okay. And so we did that interview and it was, I think it's bombshell. So that's what's coming up instead of Bill C-47. And I'll play that one in the next um, podcast episode, which was interesting to begin with, right? So, but anyway, that's, that's the one I'm switching up. So really, really interesting. This is something that we definitely need to be concerned about. So anyway, uh, one other news item I wanted to cover and I did a, little bit, did a little bit of my own research for this one, so you'll be impressed with that, I guess, um, is I wanted to cover the Canadian Tire hysteria about the SKSs. So Canadian Tire issues a, a stop sale order on SKSs and accessories, and a myriad of different stories are floating around as to why they did that. So in short, Tracy Wilson dug up a couple of different explanations, uh, including she did, I think she did a, uh, a live broadcast uh, or attempted to do that from um, a local Canadian Tire um store in, in her area. But one of them being that uh, costs from the importer had increased substantially and was making it hard to sell SKSs at Canadian Tire um, locations at a profit. And the other rumor was that um, the SKS was maybe being prohibited and that Canadian Tire knew something that the, that the uh, none of the rest of us knew and they were liquidating their inventory in advance. So um, it's really hard to know what the truth is. So what I did was I, <laughs> I just like literally two hours ago called the CSAAA to see what they knew about it. Because the CSAAA, if you guys aren't familiar with them, they are sort of, um, they're an industry group except for firearms businesses. So they're, they're an industry advocacy organization, I guess, if I were to kind of <laughs> butcher an explanation of, of who the CSAAA are. And my interactions with the CSAAA have been, have been great. Seemed like a great group of people. So I called them up. And I asked them about it and um, Allison DeGroote, who's the managing director there, and, uh, and also uh, Wes Winkle, who's the president, they were kind enough to kind of uh, throw together a statement, um, kind of detailing what they know about this. And I really appreciate Allison and, uh, and Wes for doing that. So I wanted to give them props for that. And I'm going to read this here for you. So they sent this to me literally an hour ago. So statement from the CSAAA regarding CTC, that's uh, Canadian Tire Corporation's decision to stop selling SKS rifles. So here it is. It's our understanding that Canadian Tire's decision to stop selling SKS rifles was a board of directors decision in response to the recent events in Las Vegas. 
The distributor that supplies Canadian Tire received word about a week ago that Canadian Tire would discontinue sales of the SKS rifles and that all remaining inventory would be returned to the distributor in exchange for a credit less restocking fees. Sources involved told the CSAAA that the CTC board initially requested stores to stop selling all semi-automatic rifles, but that recommendation was ultimately voted down. That's kind of interesting, hey? Uh, Quote, uh, I guess this is from Wes. We are disappointed in Canadian Tire's decision given there's no regulation preventing them from carrying SKS, SKS rifles in Canada, nor does their decision contribute to increased public safety in Canada or in Las Vegas, said Wes Winkle, president of the CSAAA, which represents Canadian shooting sports business owners. Uh, Winkle admits there's, uh, there's also always a concern when a retailer as big and as well-connected as Canadian Tire make a decision like this that they somehow have a heads up on coming regulatory changes. The retailer was the first to pull 1022 magazines off the shelves prior to an announced change by the RCMP in their classification. So, however, in this case, we believe the decision was directly related to the recent incident in Las Vegas, Winkle said. The CSAAA is bracing for changes to Canada's firearm regulations promised for this fall by the Liberal government that the Liberals say will be in line with their gun policies outlined in their campaign platform. It is not clear at this point what direction those changes will take and if they will include changes to the SKS in particular. So um, there you have it from the CSAAA. Uh, Interesting story. Um, But anyway, keep in mind when it comes to Canadian Tire, I mean, they sell a lot of stuff, right? They don't just sell guns. And I think gun, I think a lot of Canadian tire locations, I think they have corporate locations and they have franchise locations that are privately owned. I think, uh, I think a lot of the franchise guys, they, they want to sell firearms because they're in jurisdictions where, you know, rural, rural locations where people want firearms, they expect that from Canadian tire. And maybe they have, um, you know, urban locations where they don't want anything to do with firearms. So I think they're trying to just make the best uh, decisions for the franchise, the brand overall, but Anyway, uh, like I said, thanks to Allison and Wes for putting that together. Okay, now coming up after the break, a telephone interview with a truly great friend of gun owners, MP Bob Zimmer. The media constantly makes a connection between licensed gun owners and criminal use of firearms. Whether it's intentional or not, the effect is the same. The average non-gun owning Canadian agrees with our country's ineffective and prejudicial regulations. There is one organization in Canada that focuses on taking back public opinion, and that's the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. Stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms. Donate now or become a member at www.firearmrights.ca. And now, a CCFR exclusive interview. Welcome back, everybody. All right, I've got this interview with Bob that I've been threatening you guys with since this uh, since this episode started. Um, I think it's a really, really awesome interview. And, and I, I just want to say a couple of things about Bob, actually, before we just start. Now, Bob Zimmer is a real true friend of gun owners. Okay, he really is. And I think a lot of gun owners, they don't understand. Like, Bob takes flack even from gun owners, man. He takes, Bob takes flack, has taken flack for not going far enough from firearm organizations, for gosh sakes, right? Um, and I think a lot of people just don't, you know, I, I think, how, how do you say this really? A lot of people expect a lot from others without without really doing much or risking much themselves. Um, some people risk too much of themselves and expect everybody else to jump on board, not understanding that everyone has their own concerns and their own, you know, stuff to deal with. So. Um, I, if, if I got to stand here by myself and say it, I'll just say that I think Bob is a, is a huge friend of gun owners and I personally appreciate everything that he's done. And, uh, not everybody really understands, um, everything that an MP risks when they say, you know, I'm going to stand up for, for firearm owners, especially with all the things that, that go on and all the, uh, all the media that's against us and, and everything that's against us. It's a real risk for, for MPs and, uh, and you got to appreciate it for whatever they're willing to do for us. So thank you, Bob, for that. So there you go. You've heard it from me directly. Anyway, uh, I'm going to play this telephone interview. It's fantastic. And uh, don't forget, I've got another interview with Bob coming up that I've saved uh, about Bill C-47 in, uh, in the next episode. 
All right, on the phone we've got Bob Zimmer, uh, MP for Prince George Peace River in Northern Rockies again, and Bob has agreed to talk to us about Bill C uh, C52, yeah, yes. and uh, that uh, has to do with the Quebec Long Gun Registry. So, um, how's yes. it going, Bob? Pretty good, pretty good, uh, Rod. Thanks for having me on. Well, I appreciate it. Um, so, tell us a little bit about that, and I definitely have some questions about this one. Yeah, this was the bill that uh, a lot of us, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, feedback on our video, Blaine Calkins and I, we had seen this come out. Uh, Arnold Bierson as well had caught it. And it started off as a, as an act to amend the act to end the long gun registry. That's how it originally was worded, so it got our attention right away. And they changed it. They actually backed down and they changed it to this, which sounded a lot less uh, firearms related, an act to amend Chapter 6 of the Statutes of Canada 2012 <laughs> Act. For obvious reasons, they didn't want to get the firearms community up in arms over this. But it was too late because, uh, again, Blaine Calkins said I made a video about it. But what it seeks to do, it seeks to hand a copy or provide a copy, make it available to the minister responsible in Quebec. So the registry, as it exists today, it exists on two hard drives that are in a vault. And as far as as my understanding in the information commissioner's office, there's two copies of the hard drive with only the Quebec data. And some ask back of us, okay, why does this thing exist when it was supposed to have been destroyed? This is where it gets very interesting because we, we saw this through the court. We saw it through even with Minister Blaney of getting rid of the rest of the data in Canada, et cetera, when we had you know, killed the registry, but there was an appeal made. But that uh, appeal had failed, and uh, Quebec had failed in their appeal to retain their particular information. The reason why it still existed was, uh, the reason I get a lot of questions of why wasn't it destroyed then? It was because there was a previous case where a copy of the long gun registry data had been requested by a guy named Bill Clinet. So it predated the Quebec request for the data. So now there's two cases asking for a copy of the firearms uh, registry. And Bill Clinet, most of, uh, if anybody remembers, he was the person that was uh, the Shawinigan handshake, uh, the one with Chan and, and his response to Mr. Clinet. Well, that's the same Bill Clinet that originally had had the first request for a copy of the registry data when he saw that it was going to be likely destroyed by our, our then conservative government. So with him making that request and it predating the Quebec request, uh, once the Quebec appeal had failed, there still was an outstanding request by Mr. Bill Clinette for that particular data. And that's why it couldn't completely be destroyed because there was this outstanding request. He had been given a copy, we are told, heavily redacted copy of the original long gun registry uh, from the information commissioner. And he had said that it wasn't sufficient enough. And my understanding was because it was heavily redacted. And that request is still outstanding. So it hasn't been, Bill Clinette hasn't said, okay, I have enough information here. I'm not going to, my request is fulfilled. So he hasn't said that. He still is asking for a further, more detailed copy of the registry. So then Minister Blaney had actually destroyed the rest of the data as a then minister, all but the Quebec data, uh, to again, to uh, provide to the Connect case, asking for this particular copy. So that's why it still exists. And I've told, uh, there's a few people that understand the issue that are close to me that, that know about the Bill Clinet issue. Most people I know don't even know that there's a request made by Bill Clinet. So why does the registry still exist today? It re exists today because of a man named Bill Clinet that has an outstanding request. Now, the problem with Bill C-52 is, is that Bill C-52 is asking to give a copy of this to the Quebec government. Well, the government of Quebec failed in its appeal to get a copy of the long gun registry. So for us, for for the Minister of Public Safety, Mr. Ralph Goodale, asking for a copy of a preserved registry that wasn't preserved for Quebec because they had failed in their appeal. It was only preserved for Mr. Clinette. Well, once Mr. Clinette's uh, request is fulfilled, that 
copy of that data should not be given to anybody else but to fulfill that request. And even then, that's debatable. You, you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So to offer something that was saved for Mr. Clinette and offer it off to Quebec, who had already failed in their appeal, we think is beyond uh, be, beyond legal. And this is what we want to challenge the minister and what I challenged the minister uh, several months ago in the House, that this shouldn't happen. And the transfer, first, we didn't know about the bill, Connect. That's why I asked, why does this exist in the House? But knowing why it exists, well, just ask further questions. Why would something preserved for a, an individual be given over to the provincial government when they've already failed in their appeal? So this is another, uh, you know, we talked about Bill C-47, but Bill C-52 is just as concerning and just as much pressure needs to put it, be put on Mr. Uh, Ralph Goodale uh, to not make this copy available to Quebec. Okay, so a couple of questions. Was the Quebec appeal, um, when it was lost, was that in the Supreme Court? Yes. Okay, so the Supreme Court rules that Quebec is not entitled to that data, period. That was the ruling, Correct. really, right? Correct. Absolutely. Well, number two, wh- like, who is Bill Clinet to be entitled to a copy of the registry in the first place? So, so anybody so entitled in, to in a, Yeah, in a way, in a way mm. uh, I would say we could be encouraged by the fact that any citizen can ask for something of government that's part of what our system entails. What's concerning to me and many, many others that are part of that database how can one individual ask for some private information that's contained in that database? You know, can other countries ask for this information? Can country that's maybe a state that we don't agree with ask to know where all the firearms owners, where they basically reside and uh, in the areas they reside in our country? Um, there's more alarming questions of how he was even given a heavily redacted copy, let alone even uh, given anything. Um, and that's what, what we're, you know, there's many concerns that are brought to light with this request uh, and the fact that he was given one. So I have actually, our office made a request to the information commissioner asking for an exact copy of what was offered to Mr. Bill Clinette, and I they won't even give that to me. <laughs> so I just want to see, okay, do we have anything to be worried about? And the most that we could understand was that this list has uh, – I don't know if it was uh, uh, regional areas of where these firearms owners would live. So instead of your personal address, it would be an area where you lived. Well, that information is still very concerning if you're an out-of-state actor that wants to know where all the firearms owners in Canada live. Uh, You know, for some nefarious reason, they want to do something to, to Canadians in Canada. Well, now they know where most of the firearms owners live in Canada. Anyway, that list to me, to give out th- that detail, even heavily redacted information is deeply concerning. So there's a lot of questions. There's more questions that get asked, actually, the, the more we dig into this. And uh, that's the last we had heard. Uh, the last request that I had made was for a copy, and, and we were told we weren't able to access one. So, But again, coming back to C-52, we want... Minister Goodell to do the right thing and destroy both remaining hard drives that have the Quebec data in it, and then there's no problem. Then it's done. Mm, what do you think the likelihood of that a, is? Well, uh, we've seen them back down on issues before. We see them backing down on issues uh, with taxation and with uh, many other issues, just like the the markings they've backed down on. So my hope is with uh, sufficient pressure that he will back down on this one as well. Because, again, it's a bait and switch. It's not asking for something that's deserved to a particular province. This is asking something a previous province has failed in their appeal all the way to, up to the Supreme Court has failed. And is the only reason they exist is for something completely different. Do they still want to provide a copy to that particular province? To me, it's it's beyond. And uh, we need to make sure that he knows that what he's trying to do is wrong. Mm-hmm. And again, it, that to me uh, would reestablish the firearms registry in Canada because let's say uh, Minister Goodell is successful and he passes Bill C-52 and a copy is produced and Quebec says, okay, we'll take the data. Well, then the province takes the data and will, of course, be old data because it's stated as of 2012. So then what is the province going to do next? Well, it's going to seek to update the data. Well, you know, if if 
that could be all kinds of Canadians that are on that list, not just Quebecers. Mm -hmm. So once it seeks to update its list, well, where is it going to get the updated information from? Well, it could be something from Bill C-47 and uh, the information that they can pull from from different uh, uh, firearms uh, retailers across Canada. So uh, there's a lot of what-ifs, but the potential is there to completely reestablish the registry. Again, flying in the face of what they promised constituents, their own constituents, that they wouldn't do uh, in 2015. They said they wouldn't reestablish it. My concern is they're, they're just doing it, but doing it through the back door again. Hmm. So in, in your opinion, um, the fact that they retained that data was probably legal because there was an outstanding request from, yes, yes. you know, Mr. Absolutely, because the, the, the question we had back was why did Minister Blaney, why did he preserve this data in appearance of, uh, why didn't he just destroy it? Well, because as a minister is obliged to, this is a commissioner of the of the House of Commons now, like commissioner of information, um, you have to abide by their request. So the request was made to preserve a copy for Bill Clinette in this case, and he did what he was supposed to do. It really clears Minister Blaney from uh, from not destroying the full uh, registry, like some thought he should, because he was legally obliged to preserve a copy for the Information Commissioner. You know, it would be an interesting discussion to know, uh, or an interesting thought, um, when did Mr. Clinet make that request? Was it after um, Bill C-19 you know, the act and yes. the long gun registry, was it after once Bill he, C-19? Once he saw, we have the dates, I don't have it right in front of me, uh-huh. but the dates did. Once he saw that the registry, once we were going to, as a government, we were, he, he knew we were going to be successful, essentially, in defeating it. That's when he made his request. Oh, so it was it, after we were so elected it's, it's in 2011. Up. So it's straight up. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to make this request because I'm going to get that data before you guys destroy it. Yeah. You bet. And, who and if Quebec, mm-hmm. if Quebec had had asked their made their request first, I think it might be different because a province asking for it, it fails at the court of appeal, likely would have been destroyed in in its complete state, right? Right. And and, but and since this predated the Quebec request, that's why it still exists. And who is Bill Clinton again? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, if you look it up on Google, it's the Shawinigan handshake, and it's when there was a confrontation between uh, Prime Minister Kretsch and, and a citizen. And okay. Just look it up. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's an infamy. It's known as the, the Shawinigan handshake. Got it. But that's the same Bill Clinton. Interesting. Interesting. So yeah. um, now for Quebec to the, you know, going fast forwarding right to the end of this whole yep. thing, for Quebec to... Uh, believe that it's entitled to that information because it still exists. That that doesn't sound legal to me. No, and and to be fair to Quebec, all this the legislation in C52 says, it says that the Minister of Public Safety will provide a copy if the minister responsible in Quebec wishes to have it. So it's not even acting on a request by the Quebec government. That's an it's offer. saying we're going to make a copy if you want it. That's what all the C-52 is saying, which is kind of strange in and of itself, because you're not even it's not even being officially a requested item. And maybe that's worded that way because they don't know which government is still going to be there, I guess, depending on what the, what the day of the request is. But, but this is all under the initiative and the incentive of the Minister of Public uh, Safety offering a copy if they wish to have it. So Quebec could still say, ah, no, we're good. We don't want that anymore. Hmm. But uh, so it's an interesting bill, Bill C-52. But but again, we need to make sure that they feel the pressure of this, and uh, and firearms owners across Canada need to understand the significance of this kind of a bill passing in Canada, and what that's setting up. Uh, it doesn't say long gun registry on there, but that's what it's doing. That's a very twisted tale. It is. Yeah. Uh, it takes me a lot longer normally to explain that, but and there's more details, but that's the, the essence of the whole thing. It's a very interesting thing, and uh, it's surprising who doesn't know that. Even some of what we would call firearms experts in Canada still don't didn't know why that data still existed. Well, we do now. Well, and there was always some suspicions that the RCMP still had it, uh, had a, uh, a working version of that uh, during High River. Yeah. yeah. There was rumors of that, yes, for sure. Rumors, yeah. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you shedding some light on that, Bob. And uh, yeah. yeah, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Rod. And again, thanks for all what you do in the community out there that uh, just supports law-abiding farms owners. There's a bunch of us here in Ottawa that agree that we need to make sure that that, that part of our heritage is preserved and, and do our best to do that out here in Ottawa. So again, thanks for what you guys do. Great. Thanks again for coming on. Well, there you are. What a fantastic interview with uh, with Bob. Big thanks uh, to Bob. And I've got another interview coming up in the next episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. That's going to do it for Episode 9. Look forward to some big announcements in the next episode, and I will see you all soon. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca. 